Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. And hello, I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This segment's brought to you by my company, Bull Realty. For asset and occupancy solutions, visit bullrealty.com or you feel free to reach out to me directly at michael at bullrealty.com. Once a year, I like to do a show on this very important topic when it comes to commercial real estate. Well, at least important to me, so I hope it is to you. And that is zoning, you know, entitlement. Because, you know, there's a lot of change in use happening right now. You know, we have a lot of properties retail changing. We have a lot of office properties changing. Obviously, it's a great way for property owners, investors to improve values and, and do more for their for their community. Uh, and also, it's a hot topic sometimes, right? Some people are against zoning and some people are for it. So it's a, an interesting topic. And um, I'd like you to invite, uh, welcome my guest is Patrick Fox. He's CEO of Consensus Strategies and he's joining us on video. Patrick Fox, sir, thanks for uh, being on the show. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you being on because you're an expert. You, you handle large zoning deals all over all over the country. You've got great experience and and it's up to date. And it's real interesting to, to talk to you about what you're kind of seeing around the country on some of these large rezoning issues. And uh, the first thing that I think my audience might be curious about is how is it going on some of these retail properties, some of these old malls, some of these older retail properties, when it comes to rezoning them today for mixed use, uh, for example, so you have maybe multifamily offices and hotel, are the municipalities being a little more agreeable? Because it seemed like for years they'd like, oh no, it's gotta be retail, we want the sales tax. Uh, they are in, in many places, every place is different, but generally we're seeing uh, 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 greater acceptance and uh, and excitement about th that kind of investment coming to a community. When you're coming there with retail, you could talk about uh, the current status of the retail market in that it's highly competitive trying to bring these investments in. A lot of the um, uh, larger developers, uh, the larger mixed use projects are looking at innovative ways to uh, attract people because retail isn't attracting people like it used to. So we're seeing entertainment districts and zones and uh, other types of attractions that they're using to try to, to generate traffic. And what about the, the cost for development? It seems like a lot of these municipalities put up a, a lot of roadblocks and, and costs that sometimes uh, prohibit development. What, are you seeing a trend there? Is, it, is that changing at all? Yeah, we're generally seeing that going down, right? again, Everything you know, it's, it's different everywhere, but generally, uh, it's it's a more competitive process right now. Um, and there is, uh, and I do try to set up every zoning battle as a um, uh, we, we try to make it part of the argument that this is a competitive process. If you don't want this investment in your community, there are lots of other communities that do. And uh, you know, whether it's mixed use, a warehouse. Um, uh, uh, condos, you know, whatever it is, it's a competitive process out there for development in these communities. It's interesting that you called it uh, a battle. <laughs> so you just know up front it's gonna be a battle usually, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, no matter what you do, even, you know, we do a lot of survey work and focus groups. And even in a community where we could take a poll and find out that, that for a certain proposed project, there's 75 or 80% support for it throughout the community. And my clients laugh at that because they know when they go to do the hearing, the only people in the room are the people opposed. Um, and they're always showing up. The, the abutters, the special interest groups, environmentalists, um, the, the cadre of people that are going to oppose everything, the, the, the cave people, if you will, the citizens <laughs> against virtually everything. Um, and you know, that sort of leads into the, 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 this, the uh, new trend now, thanks to COVID, for us to do virtual meetings, public hearings, uh, webinars. Um, and that's a huge benefit for developers. Um, and they should be taking full advantage of that. We started saying about a year and a half ago to our clients, take your most controversial, largest, most important strategic projects and move them to the front. Do it while you can do these kinds of meetings where opponents can't hijack them. It's much more difficult for opponents to hijack a virtual meeting. 
and, and this does a couple of things. I mean, we've always had this problem where um, opponents dominate the planning and zoning system in the United States and in lots of other countries in which we work. Um, and there's always been a struggle for how do you move beyond the immediate abutters and the special interest groups. And virtual meetings do that. Um, it, it's so much easier for people to join. Uh, and so we can get people that aren't immediate abutters or aren't uh, uh, special interests that have the welfare of the community, that are look, that understand the need for tax base, for jobs, um, and, and for, for other commercial development in town. So, yeah, um, I think, you know, and I hope my, my listeners and viewers are really taking listening to you here because it's really a significant change. I mean, you know, you think about 99 people are for it, one's against it. And when they were there in person, it, it, it was it was pretty, you know, it was pretty hurtful. Right. And now with this process, it's more controlled. Right. And um, as we've all seen, when you go to these hearings or these public meetings, community meetings, um, any kind of, of in-person meeting, you can have 50 people or 200 people in the audience, and there could be three that are vocal, um, aggressive, and that speak out at the beginning and cause the rest of the room to just be quiet. They're not going to ask any questions. They're not going to um, uh, say anything for the project. They're just going to back off. And that makes... Other people in the room think everybody, everyone there is against it when they they weren't necessarily. If there's a reporter in the room, they'll write, there were 200 people there and the only comments were negative um, because those aggressive opponents scare everybody else off. I'm not here to fight with my neighbors. You know, I'm here to get information on a project or to support it. So uh, the virtual meeting eradicates that. Those people that are opposed get their say. Oftentimes, you know, it's you get you get three minutes, say what you're going to say, and then we move on to the next person. So their impact is the same as everybody else's. Everybody gets a say. And uh, it works out much, much better, much more controlled. Um, and you get more rational decision making that way. Yeah, that that's such good news, you know, I think for, for everyone, really, uh, because when people are opposed, they can uh, get pretty emotional and that emotion can, can, can roll over to everyone else. Right. And then if we could go back for a minute and get your view on, on the rezoning, repurposing some of these retail properties, um, that are becoming obsolete in some cases to industrial more for distri distribution. What are you seeing there? Is that our municipalities more open to that now than they were? Or what do you see? They are in, in some of the places that have legalized uh, cannabis. You know, you're seeing cultivation facilities um, and uh, retail facilities popping up in in some of those places. Um, but uh, people have have had to get more uh, innovative and creative uh, with, uh, with 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 uses. And um, y you can't, you know, in the in the old days, uh, sometimes you could slide some of this through. Um, you could meet with city councilors or planning board members and uh, just sort of go through the process quietly. And that doesn't really happen anymore. Uh, it, so with every single project, you should be prepared for a room full of concerned um, and uh, uh, fearful abutters and residents. Um, and you need to do the outreach. It's easy to figure out if you do a little bit of political due diligence who are the people in any community that always come out, um, that are frequent flyers, we call them, at these <laughs> local public meetings, yeah. and talk to them ahead of time? And it used to be developers worried, if I do that, I'm, I'm going to give them a heads up, and, I, and that's going to encourage them to come to the meeting. They're coming anyway. And um, you know, with the internet, they're all talking to each other. Uh, rumors are going to spread faster than uh, the truth if you don't get ahead of it. So you know, I, I do encourage everyone on these projects, do that political due diligence and make sure you're arranging for support in the room. I've got projects right now, I've got a few of them across the country where I, I get called after they've already taken a shot. They, they, mm -hmm. All the political people told them you they, they were in, in fine shape. The board members said, come on in, we're all for you. And when they come in, there's 200 angry residents in the room. Yeah. And 
you know, and, and I'll say to them, show me the slides you used, the presentation, and there's no community benefits in it. Well, we didn't think we needed it. Nobody said anything ahead of time. Um, what neighbors did you talk to? What abutters did you speak to before you came in here? We didn't bother. We thought we were fine. Well, now they want to come back and do it again, but there's blood in the water. You know, now we, we've got a whole group of, of neighbors that have, have stopped this project and are excited and energized by it. And as soon as they hear you're coming back for more, they're going to ramp right up and come right back at you. So it's going to require three times more work to go and turn them around, to generate enough support to offset that, and to provide enough political cover so that those local officials can support a project that they know the community needs anyway. Yeah, I, I think that keys right back into to what you call the the process uh, earlier in this in, in, when we were talking to, today, and you called it a battle, right? Just be ready. There's going to be a battle. You think there's not? Uh, there's going to be. I uh, rezoned a property that, that, that was three or four acres to take an acre and build a home. And the city council, everybody said, yeah, it's no problem. It's going to be approved. We got to the meeting and one neighbor came in and said that if I built that house, her uh, yet to be born child would die, actually die. That's what she said. Now, she said this isn't a child that that is alive or, or he was, she wasn't pregnant. <laughs> but one day there'd be a child and that child would die if I built that house. And you know what? They turned it down. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's just crazy out there, isn't it? Well, we get that in traffic arguments all the time. Uh, you know, how many people are going to have to die before you people stop building? It, it's just a, <laughs> yeah. a relevant argument. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's um, it, it, some people get upset when I call it a battle. In reality, we you have to start with a mutual gains approach, right? Um, talk to everybody. Let them know what it is you want to do and, and try to come up with, mutually acceptable solutions. After that, um, it becomes a battle because we've now done everything to placate everybody. This assumes we're doing a project that's a good project, responsible, that, that really benefits the community. But then we're still going to have, in most situations, intractable opposition. People that will not talk to us, people that are going to oppose us no matter what we do, no matter what we say. Um, and, uh, we have to generate enough support to overcome that in the room um, and to let elected officials know they're not committing political suicide to vote for a project they know the community needs already. Yeah. Yeah. Great points. We're talking with Patrick Fox. He's CEO of Consensus Strategies about uh, rezoning. And I think it's such a, a big, important issue when it comes to commercial real estate investors and owners. Um, so, one question that some of our clients have uh, is about rezoning a property that they own that they plan to sell. And, you know, they say, hey, Michael, should I go ahead and rezone this for multifamily or for mixed use so that when we go to market, maybe we get a, we get a higher price? Uh, and then then we have some of the, the buyers that say, oh, no, please don't do that because you're going to get some requirements that you're going to agree to that kill it for us and we're not going to want to buy it. What do you see overall out there related to that timing, Patrick? So there's no one answer for that. It falls into that political due diligence that we were talking about, right? It depends upon the relationship and reputation of the owner in that community. Um, there are times where uh, they're a multi-generational uh, family um, that is loved and respected in the community, and they're going to be the best voice. Um, and uh, th that's the right way to move forward. In other situations, it's the opposite, wh where uh, uh, you know, they're seen as having overdeveloped or um, might be seen as a greedy local developer, and you're going to be better off bringing in a new face and doing it in a new way. It's, it's, um, it is tempting for the owner to rezone the property to try to get the highest and best use out of it to, to maximize its sale value. Um, but, you know, I would, I would urge independent political due diligence review of that situation. Um, I just had a client the other day um, where I had, um, uh, they asked me to consult on a project that they've run into big opposition to. I watched a local um, uh, board meeting, a planning board meeting that had 200 people 
screaming at this developer, this local uh, landowner. Mm-hmm. And uh, right after I watched that, he said to me, my reputation is impeccable and everyone loves me. <laughs> and I had to say to him, I just watched a two-hour meeting with 200 people screaming at you, and they don't think your reputation is impeccable, and they don't love you. Um, so uh, sometimes people don't uh, uh, can't uh, uh, see themselves in their own situation uh, accurately and need uh, an independent review. Yeah, that's true. And if they, if a property owner or a consultant. Uh, Maybe it's a lawyer, a broker, accountant that's that's advising a property owner. If that property owner does think that it's proper to go ahead and try to, to rezone it to a highest and best use, um, what would you caution them about in that process? Um, well, uh, they need to make sure that, that there aren't restrictions put on that rezone that preclude uh, what the, uh, the buyer would want. Um, so it, it's uh, it's 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 a fairly complicated decision to make, um, and it, it depends a lot upon the local political situation. Yeah, yeah, good point. And yeah, we've seen that where if somebody does rezone it, then the buyers come in as well. We didn't want that unit mix, or you know, we didn't like that height, or we didn't like that facade, or you know, something, and and it it kills it for a buyer. So we've certainly seen those situations where it's best to. To find a buyer, pick a buyer, and and let them you know handle the process so they get what they want. And in some cases, uh, uh, to your point earlier, you know the the buyer may be better off. And we have a big land group here at our firm, and and we've been selling land for a, a long time, and, and we represent sellers. And one of the things that we tell them, look, when we pick a buyer, it's not just the highest price and the quickest close. If it's going to need entitlements and rezoning, it's like all right. Have you? Have, what's your success in the rezoning, and who are you going to use? Right. I, I gave them an example. If I was the buyer, and and I told you I was personally going to handle the rezoning, do not go with me because mostly I will be terrible at it. I won't. I won't get my zoning approved. Right. Use somebody that hey has a track record that's using professionals. Right. Yeah. The the other thing to remember is uh, a lot of times when you look at these situations, the property owner could go for sort of a generic rezone towards the use that he think would be the highest and best use. Um, In that, when, when, um, when people try to talk about putting restrictions on it, um, we don't know who the ultimate user is going to be. And we can say, you know, anyone who who comes in is going to have to go before this board as well. Um, you know, sometimes it'll work out better that way, right? Uh, because we can't talk about the ultimate user. Yeah. You know, we're seeing this with, with warehouse space uh, uh, a lot too. You know, you can do sort of a um, um, generic rezone for warehouse, and they're typically going to have to come in and ask for uh, uh, ad- additional things. But, you know, there's an awful lot of calculus in there. Yeah. Have you had uh, an experience yet, Patrick, of uh, rezoning? Uh, for development of build to rent um, residences uh, and seeing uh, how people react to that in, in the area? It's all about the schools, right? Um, and uh, uh, we're trying where we can to market them uh, in places where it's going to be a real problem, try to market them to uh, 55 and older, um, try to market them to um, people from that community who want to stay in that community um, and, uh, you know, empty nesters or uh, retirees who want to move up because yeah. these are ways to to advocate for development that's not going to impact the schools and infrastructure in, in quite the same way right. um, the, that the others will. The better right. the school system, the more difficult it's going to be because okay. it's more in demand. All right. And then another question for you, Patrick, and that involves uh, timing, you know, as our land brokers uh, tell us here in our shop that, you know what, be ready for, for a very long time frame. But yet uh, we had a, a seller that we didn't represent. We we're working on a deal yesterday uh, that's going to need some uh, rezoning and title. And they said, well, we want you to close in, in 60 days. <laughs> And like, it's like, all right, guys, what are you thinking? You want to get a high price on this, but you want to cram the, 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 the deal down somebody's throat. They can't pay the big number. What are you seeing trend-wise on timing? Is, is it taking longer? Is it a shorter time frame? What's the trend there overall? 
during COVID, it, things slowed down a lot, and they're speeding back up. Um, but you know, this goes back once again to that political due diligence process, right? Because um, with with some projects, we can talk about it's it's a it's a uh, competitive landscape. Other communities want it. If you don't, uh, you're going to have to move this project along, or we're going somewhere else. Uh, we've got. Um, uh, options and deals that are predicated upon moving things uh, forward at a certain pace. Depends on the community. In some places, they're going to say, that's your problem, not mine. In others, they're going to fight to keep it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Good. Well, Patrick, uh, I know you've uh, been doing this a long time and, and done some, some really big projects and doing some big projects around the country. Um, I want to ask you about some of the funny things you've seen or, or ridiculous and crazy things you've seen happen in some of these zoning meetings that people do or say? Uh, I would say the uh, the big uh, things that are happening now that are uh, very amusing is uh, um, the uh, virtual meetings, uh, whether they're community meetings or actual public hearings, where um, people do not know how to use the equipment. Mm -hmm. And we've got city councilors uh, uh, we had a city council chair say, our, uh, in the middle of a public hearing, we're going to go to a break. And then he turns and he says, hey, Edith, did you hear this BS? <laughs> and everybody heard it. Yeah. We've had uh, a city councilor say, I don't open mic. There's no way I'm voting for this. I hate that guy. Um, <laughs> and we've had, uh, uh, we had a developer in the Midwest on an open mic threatened that he was going to out uh, a uh, a gay board member, oh, you know. Uh, oh. Now, uh, so lawsuits come out of these things, um, and, uh, uh, and projects are being killed based on it. Um, and uh, it's 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 bad enough when a municipal official or an elected official does it. When a developer does it, it's a self inflicted, needless wound. So we've been urging all of our clients to to practice with the equipment, to have people who know what they're doing, um, to, to make sure that you're set up for this. And hopefully we're going to be doing this permanently. We want to try to keep these virtual meetings going as long as we can because they're beneficial for us and they're beneficial for the, the municipalities. Um, you know, everything from uh, uh, you know, experts that are being brought into some of these hearings with virtual backgrounds, and we've had academics wearing giant headphones with a virtual background that looks like uh, they're in a library. But every time they move their head, it half melts into the background mm -hmm. and they look goofy with the big headphones. Mm -hmm. that, it's just not a good look for your expert. Um, you know, so it's, it's uh, a preparation, understanding how to use this stuff. And, you know, just like Ronald Reagan, who announced over an open mic that uh, he's outlawed Russia and bombing begins immediately. <laughs> and uh, the White House had to scramble over that mistake. We're seeing developers do it all the time. Assume every microphone is an open mic. When you when you end a, um, a public hearing or a virtual meeting, don't start talking the second they say it's over. Make sure, make triple sure that you're off the meeting, that your microphones are off um, and uh, you know, always assume every microphone is live. Yeah, that's a very good point. And and and, and f the listeners and viewers I know are doing a lot of virtual meetings themselves. And so your your tips there are important for whatever you're doing online. You know, and if, if you're watching the video version, you see Patrick and you know his he's he's perfectly lit. The sounds great. The background's perfect. Uh, and you know you're going to come off more professional. Uh, my team won a very large assignment to sell a very large office building. And, and they said, hey, you guys are great. That's why we picked you. But we also want to tell you that the other groups, the, the, the presentations when they were in their own homes and on these, on these videos, it was just terrible. It was unprofessional and it just came across wrong. So whatever you're doing, think about that. And, and it's a great tip there, Patrick. And, and uh, Patrick, tell us about the, um, was it a, a, a lady when you were, doing a rezoning for some uh, uh, windmills? <laughs> you always love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, uh, uh, this was another one in the, uh, in the Midwest. Um, a, uh, a woman stood up at a hearing where uh, we were trying to get uh, a wind farm set up that would have 100 wind turbines. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm fine with this, except if you're going to do this, you need to build 100 wind turbines pointing in the other direction or you're going to screw up the rotation of the earth. <laughs> yeah, I do love that. 
which is very much like the guy who uh, uh, opposed a solar farm saying, how many of these things do you think you can build before you've sucked all the energy out of the sun? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we talk to our clients about being prepared that you can't laugh at these people. <laughs> right. uh, you can't ridicule them, be respectful, uh, understand that the board will will know that uh, uh, these aren't legitimate topics. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's only so much uh, physics that we can teach the public at one of these public hearings. Yeah, and that's a good example. I couldn't be there because I would just laugh out loud. <laughs> uh, wasn't there, uh, you were, we're trying to get approval for a steakhouse one time? Yes, uh, and uh, somebody got up and said, uh, you can't build a steakhouse because the neighborhood dogs will go crazy. <laughs> the neighborhood dogs will go crazy. This is this is not a reason not to build. Yeah. Uh, how about just the steak lovers that, that walk by too? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> hear it. Well, Patrick, so, uh, it, 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 there's there's endless stupidity out there. Yeah, you just have to find the humor in it. Yeah, I, t I tell you, it, it is, it is, yeah, you, you got to laugh so you don't cry sometimes, I think. Patrick, what would you leave our audience to think about related to the zoning and entitlements moving forward? Political due diligence. Make sure that, uh, take the time, uh, you know, you, you do all kinds of due diligence on market area and finances. Too many people aren't doing the political due diligence. You know, find out if, the, 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 the half the planning board was just elected on a no growth platform. Find out if the lawyer that you hired is in a, 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 a some kind of grudge with the speaker of the house who's going to make sure that nothing ever gets built. You know, um, uh, take take a, a week or so and figure out the politics before you commit. Great. Great, uh, Patrick. Thanks for being on the show. and Thanks for the uh, intel. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you for joining us around the country. Uh, we appreciate uh, you sharing the show and uh, reach out to if you have any any questions or uh, thoughts on it, please reach out to me. You're welcome to do that uh, directly to me, Michael at BullRealty.com. Until next week, be sure that you lead, learn and laugh and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Buxton. Take leasing site selection and due diligence to the next level. Make the right decisions with on-demand mobile data. Visit BuxtonCo.com. By Bull Realty. For proven commercial real estate asset and occupancy solutions, contact me. My email is Michael at BullRealty.com. By Commercial Agent Success. Expert level commercial real estate broker training. Cloud Access One, up to 21 one-hour videos. Visit CommercialAgentSuccess.com. Thank you for reviewing, subscribing, and sharing America's commercial real estate show.